Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the um, March uh, meeting of the uh, uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Ottawa Centre. My name is Mike Moda, and it's a real privilege to be your, uh, your, your guide tonight. I have the honour of introducing some really interesting speakers. And, and um, I have to tell you, I'm just absolutely thoroughly excited about, about tonight. Uh, tonight is the culmination of, of many months of planning. Um, I've been talking to one of our speakers, uh, Sarah Simmons, uh, for a number of months, exchanging emails. It's been a pleasure doing that, by the way, Sarah. And, and um, she has a wonderful presentation. She's, she's delivering a presentation on uh, ancient Egyptian astronomy. I've seen her presentation, as I've said in some emails to, to you. It's as good as it gets. Um, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, after Sarah's presentation, um, we're going to have a, um, a um, or pardon me, I'm jumping ahead here. After my introduction, uh, Gary's going to talk about uh, the Ottawa skies. It's his regular segment that he does um, on what to expect in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the March sky, and followed by, by Sarah. Uh, we're going to have a break at, at, that, at, at that time. And then after the break, we have our, our, our observations. And we also have a, a mystery guest that will surprise Many of you, okay, I think I'll, um, so um, quite excited about that mystery guest, as, as you'll see. Um, Simon Hammer, we all know him, okay, as uh, we're privileged to have him as our, our, our Ottawa Centre member. His, his, uh, his enthusiasm, well, it's tangible, okay, and, uh, and him and Mike Wirfs are, are, are together at delivering a presentation that is, uh, is, is something else. Uh, you, you'll, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, we got a lot of announcements, and, uh, and then I want to talk uh, as, as far as uh, uh, um, astronomy events, and uh, that I think are of interest to you. And uh, we also have a, a ton of door prizes. And I hope you have picked up your door prizes uh, as, as you entered. Um, if you a door prize tickets um, it, when you entered, um, because uh, uh, everyone is uh, it, no need to be an RASC member to to. Uh, to, 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 uh, to be eligible for door prize. We got some really uh, neat uh, door prizes here, as you'll see. One of them is a signed copy of uh, Chris Hatsfield's uh, Astronomer's Guide to Life, uh, courtesy of the uh, uh, Canadian Space Society, who have, or are, are kind enough to come here and with, their, with their booth, the Ottawa chapter. So that's, um, that's uh, one of the many door prizes we have tonight. We're going to give away the door prizes um, at, uh, uh, right at the end, end of the meeting. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so I. I um, I think it's, oh, and by the way, I, I wanted to mention as well that it's worth pointing out uh, to, to you that uh, this, this uh, meeting is broadcast live over the uh, internet. Uh, um, and uh, if you wish to watch this uh, broadcast, it'll be posted 10 minutes after the meeting. So if you miss something or you want to hear something again, it, it's on the meeting. I'll be talking about where, that, uh, where you can see, see that email address. Um, all that, by the way, this uh, recording and the internet broadcasting is courtesy of uh, Eric Cajula, who. Um, who labors away, and he's—I think—and uh, I think he's a pillar of our of our uh, of our of our club. And uh, Eric, we're truly grateful to you. For what you do. <laughs> Eric is constantly innovating. <laughs> he's constantly innovating, and he never seeks any any praise. And he quietly sits and, sits and he and he did labors away. And I'm um, Eric. You're uh, you're amazing. Uh, okay, so I bet many of you are, are here for the first time tonight. I, 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 I we gladly promoted this, this this meeting here, and you may be wondering what uh, what or uh, who the RASC is and, and what it has to offer. Since you're a captive audience now, I thought I might take a, a two minutes, steal two minutes of your time, and uh, and introduce the RASC. So. Um, Founded in 1868, the Royal Astronomical Society, thank you, of, 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 uh, of Canada, is, uh, is Canada's leading astro astronomy organization. Uh, it has over 4,200 members um, that include uh, enthusiastic uh, amateurs, uh, educators, and professionals. The Ottawa Centre is one of, 20, one of 29 centres across the, the uh, country. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, and uh, our mission? What, what, what do we do? What, what, what's our mission? Uh, what's our reason, our purpose? It's, it's to advance um, your understanding, the public's understanding of astronomy through education, through outreach, uh, and through a variety of programs and publications. So you'll hear about these activities tonight, and, um, and, uh, and I hope you actually uh, participate in, so, in some of them in, in, the coming, uh, in the coming months, and uh, for sure. Uh, our objective is to uh, inspire curiosity about, about, and promote a personal appreciation of, of, of the, uh, the beauty of the universe through, through observation and, uh, and, and really collaboration through, the, through this club here. So we love sharing our, uh, um, our uh, interest in the night sky, and I, I think it, it, it sort of speaks to a, um, 
it, it, there's a certain tranquil beauty of the, of, of the night sky. And I, 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 I know sometimes when you're out there in a, in, a, in a dark spot and it's completely dark all around you, you it, um, it, 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 there's almost something about the night sky, the dark night spot, being larger than any of us. All right, so something you'll appreciate when you're, it's, it's quiet, a little cold maybe, um, but that's all good. Uh, so our, our organization, as I said, is, is largely a group of um, amateur, astronomer, uh, amateur astronomers. Um, peppered amongst us is, is uh, our academics, uh, people who are directly or peripherally related um, or involved with astronomy or any of the allied sciences, okay, uh, in, in some capacity. Regardless of who you are, we love to talk about astronomy, okay, and that's what the RAC is, is, is all about. Uh, most of you probably know about the RAC through our public star parties uh, that we have uh, over the course of the summer and, and, the, uh, and the autumn time. Uh, in these events, we set up our telescopes. Our members set up telescopes and share views of the night sky um, w w with you. Um, something about, I wanted to say quickly about our, 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 our um, organization, the Ottawa Center, is we have some, uh, and you'll see, by the way, a slide at break time, which explains all about um, you know, what, we, what we have to offer. But some of the unique things we have to offer is we have an observatory that, we, we can, uh, that are, is available for members. We have a telescope library where you can, you can sign out like books, um, tel telescopes. We have an ex extensive library here as well, right around the corner. You'll see it. You're welcome to go take a look at it and, and see it. Um, it's, uh, it's really something. We have school and outreach programs that, that um, I know there's a number of teachers here tonight. Uh, we, we, can, we can come to your school. Um, we, can, we can give presentations. We can even do solar observing at, at, at noontime to sort of meet the s schedules of uh, students and, and, and yourself. Um, we also attend uh, a public events such as the uh, Cube Gallery's annual Nocturne event um, that is uh, run, uh, run by uh, Don Monet, who's here in the audience tonight. Wonderful event. We set up telescopes. Don, Don brings in speakers. It could, it's as good as it gets in, in July. Wonderful evening. He, he arranges for lights to be turned off on, on one of the neighboring streets. Uh, it's terrific. And we also participate in the National Science and Technology Week uh, uh, um, uh, fun, science Fun Fest is a really a premier event. We love doing that. Okay, so let me let me close. Uh, these these meetings that uh, you're participating in they occur uh, every month. So uh, great that you came this month. You're welcome to come uh, uh, next month. They're always free, and uh, they're t they're typically held on the first Friday of of, of every month. So. Um, let, that was it for the RAC. Let's go to the next uh, slide. So as always, what we like to do here is we like to welcome uh, new members. So uh, Robert Ashton, uh, if you're here tonight, or, 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 or Ashton and, and uh, Owen Crawford, can you say, say something? <laughs> okay. Whenever I've done this in the past, the, the people come up to me afterwards and say I was here. So okay, I'm sure you're here. <laughs> Okay, welcome, welcome. It's worth pointing out that since uh, since uh, January, we've had uh, two, January one, we had two, uh, we had um, fourteen new members this year. So uh, awesome. Okay, we also like to have a, um, we also like to talk about members in the news. Um, so uh, um, this one here is from uh, Mike Wirf, So you'll hear more than once tonight. Um, Mike is an interesting fellow. He's, he's, he's moved to, uh, to the Baja Peninsula. He's remained an Ottawa Centre uh, member and uh, he's a very active one, in fact. And he's, uh, he's, he's uh, well known for many things. Uh, his, his lunar astrophotography is, is, is uh, I can almost hesitate to say, I'm almost uh, confident saying, uh, second to none. This is second to no one. Uh, anyone else? Um, here he has an image of Sinus Iridium, okay, that's Latin for the uh, 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 Bay of uh, Rainbows. Uh, it appeared in the, um, this March, um, this is the March picture of the Royal Ast the RASC's uh, calendar. So, um, the Sinus Iridium, uh, for those who don't know, is, is, is formed from the remains of a large impact crater that was subsequently flooded with uh, basaltic, uh, basaltic lava. Now, Mare Imbrium, uh, I should use that laser pointer here. Which one, Chris? Um, Mare Imbrium is, is, is down here. It's, uh, it's, it, it itself is a vast uh, basaltic plain here. Um, uh, crater uh, Bianchini uh, is at the, at the top here, and it's part of the um, Montes Ura um, uh, range. And uh, the Laplace A crater, well defined here, uh, followed by a, um, the uh, Helicon uh, crater. Now, that's a very interesting shape of that crater, but we'll, we'll come to that later. Um, Mike is an amazing fellow. You'll see some more of his work later on. But uh, well done, Mike. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, next up is uh, Gary Boyle. Uh, Gary. Uh, Gary is the uh, president of our club, and uh, he, he uh, every month he gives a talk on the uh, what to expect in the night in the March night sky. He's also very prominent nationally uh, for our, uh, the RAC uh, RAC nationally, and he, his segment also appears in our uh, at the RAC national site. So, Gary, over to you.
Thank you, Mike, and welcome all. And no, I do not wear the suit every month. I did just for you people. Uh, can I have the lights up for one second, please? I'd just like to uh, see a show of hands. Uh, our first time visitors here at the museum. Once the lights are up, great, excellent. Excellent, welcome all, welcome. And uh, also, who are our members, RESC members here? Well, these are our ambassadors. If you have any questions about the Ottawa Centre or an astronomy, please see one of these people that held up their hands, okay? And of course, welcome people uh, around the internet, including I know Roman from Australia is walking, watching now, having breakfast as we watch. <laughs> so without further ado, let's start with the first slide. Well, I'm sure many of you have, have recognized Orion the Hunter, the, the prominent classic winter constellation. Um, it's my first telescope that I named. A lot, of, uh, a lot of amateurs named their telescopes, and I named this one Orion. I built in 1977. Um, and what it is really is the sky is made up of, of a lot of mythology. And there were a lot of stories when people saw these, these shapes put together, either animals or people or objects or even gods. So here we have the two shoulders of Orion's belt, his two knees, the, uh, the, the never have the paths cross. Remember Egon from, from Ghostbusters, never have the paths cross. So here we have the, the shoulder, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the sword and, and the club Shield. battling uh, towards the bull. And even just the, the sheer, um, um, no, not, not, not yet, if you go back, and just the sheer distances of stars. Here we have 4 point, or sorry, 8.6 light years or as the star in the middle is about 2,000 light years away. And this is about 800. So really you're looking at stars not like uh, wallpaper on the ceiling, but really 3D. So next slide, we'll see uh, some uh, one close-up object. If we take Sirius, the dog star, which is the eye of the dog, and come down here, we have a beautiful open cluster of stars. Um, its catalog number is M41. And uh, it's about 2,300 light years away. This is the brightness that we give to objects, just like you give brightnesses of lamps, of light bulbs. We can see down to about six magnitude. Anything brighter than that into negatives get really, really bright. The moon is negative 12, the sun's minus, minus 26. So here's a, a beautiful open cluster to look at tonight if you have binoculars, telescope, um, even naked eye uh, if you're away from, from city lights. Okay, next slide, please. So here we have planets. Um, and true Jupiter was in the first slide. I'll we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, we have number two and number three planets, which you can see visually uh, with your eye. Of course, a telescope always, ha always helps. Um, so Mars rises around 10 p.m. tonight, along with the star Spica, and Saturn around midnight. So you can see planets during the night. Um, in fact, if you go back to the first slide, I failed to show Jupiter. Jupiter's up here amongst the Gemini twins. Very, very bright star. So the five, the five wandering planets, the sun and the moon, gives us our seven days of the week. Sunday for day of the sun, Monday for day of the moon, Tuesday for French from uh, Mattis from Mekredzi, uh, Mars from uh, Mattis from Mars, Mekredzi for Wednesday, Jeudzi for Jupiter, Bondzi for Venus, and Saturn for Saturday. Okay, continuing our tour. Here. Yep. Pointer. Your pointer? Okay. Green. In the middle? In the middle. In the middle? The top. Uh oh. Oh, now what did I do? I do that every month, believe me, you'll enjoy this. <laughs> okay, sweet. Okay, so we have, we have Mars and we have Saturn. So these are, are the second and third planets uh, rising. Um, Arcturus, another prominent star up here. So a lot of these stars you can pretty well see on, on, a, on a clear night with the moon not out, because the moon does cover the sky. Being in the city, you're down to about maybe 20 stars. And of course at 3 o'clock in the morning now we're seeing the summer Milky Way starting to rise with the, um, the Scorpius, constellation of Scorpius. So some of the summer stuff is coming up here. In fact, in the mornings, I even see Cygnus the Swan when my wife and I leave at, uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning. So the sky changes four minutes each day, so that's why we get constellations slowly sinking and new ones slowly rising. Okay, next slide, because I'm going to screw it up. Put your clocks ahead this, this Saturday night going to bed at 2 a.m., 2 a.m. Sunday morning, spring ahead, fall back. Now this is going to, we're actually going to lose one hour of, of sleep, but also losing an hour of astronomy, unless you stay up all night like some people do on weekends. And I have down at the bottom now, we subtract four hours from universal time. Well, universal, universal time is the old Greenwich mean time that they have in England. Uh, because in our handbook, and anywhere pretty well, 
Um, astronomers use UT for various celestial events, say for eclipses or when the moons of Jupiter disappear behind the planet or shadow, something like that. Well, if you said it was 4 p.m., is it in Africa, is it in Ottawa, is it in Vancouver? So it's UT, which is in England, and now to convert to Ottawa time, we subtract four hours rather than the five that we had before the time change. And depending where you are in the world, you just, just convert either add or, or, add or subtract hours. Okay, next slide. Well, the, uh, the grandest of, of events will happen this month on the actually morning of the 20th, March 20th at uh, 6.08 UT, as I just mentioned, and we subtract four hours, brings it to 2.08 in the morning here in Ottawa. What will occur is, is we do have an asteroid, which is 163 Aragon, that will pass in front of a very bright star, Regulus. It's very simple to find Regulus in the constellation of Leo, which is a backwards question mark along with a nice triangle. It's actually below the Big Dipper. So the Big Dipper's right here, so if you put a pot or put a hole in the pot of the Big Dipper, it'll actually sink onto the back of Leo the Lion. And this main star will actually wink out or disappear for 14 seconds. The star does not disappear, but Aragon is actually 44 kilometers wide large, large asteroid. It will not hit us. It will be a mere 160 million kilometers from Earth. Really close, really close. But with its size, it will pass, so it will block its star for that amount of time. The only thing is that you must be on a very specific path on Earth. And this is where you, if you actually go through Kingston, a little, uh, little west of Kingston, up through Algonquin Park and down to New York State. So living in Ottawa, it's not a very far distance. Of course, if you're in Vancouver, you'd have to fly all, all the way here to see it. The great thing is that usually asteroids do pass in front of very dim stars, but this is an extremely bright star that we can see naked eye on a, on a clear night, and, um, and, and to see it over a well-populated area, that's the great part about it. And I'm sure some uh, spectrom spectrometry will be done on, on these observations too, but just the beauty of it, just like a solar eclipse, to see these things really happen, the rareness of the event. Okay, next slide, please. So yes, so the star itself is actually 1.3 magnitude, which is very bright, very, and the, uh, the asteroid is 11.1. .1. You do need binoculars or a telescope. You will not see it naked eye. Okay, next slide. A, uh, a few uh, pretty well that, that same day, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the spring equi equinox. Uh, equinox meaning equal, so we'll have 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night, and after that you'll see the daytime hours will, uh, will lengthen over time. Uh, here we have equinox for equal time for spring and fall, as opposed to the solstice, where the sun is standing still, as the solstice really means, where it stands still in, in the winter and, and the summertime. So taking now spring, next slide please, you wonder, when does anybody know when Easter is without looking at the map? Easter changes every year, right? Now how many people actually don't know, or wondering, why does that date ever change? Show of hands. What we do is we take we take the spring equinox, we come to the next full moon, which will be the pink moon, and this is Sunday right after. Oops, I did that. See what I mean? I did it. So it's the full moon, uh, sorry, the springtime, next full moon, next Sunday is, is, is Easter. So that's why I changed every month. Okay, next slide. The International Space Station can, can be seen most mornings and most nights when it's clear. It's extremely bright. Here we're in the minuses now. Remember I said we can see down to about plus six? When you're getting to the minuses, it's extremely bright. In fact, Venus is minus 4.4. So on the morning of the, uh, what day was it? Oh, sorry, March 29th. It's a, it's a morning time object because it's really uh, sunlight that reflects off its, off its uh, outer skin. It really doesn't have lights. So you'll see that it begins here in the, uh, in the west, coming, up, coming by some pretty bright stars. Here we have the summer triangle of Deneb, Vega, and Altair, and goes right by Venus and disappears. So I'll keep that in mind if you've never seen a space station. In fact, if you go to my personal website, wondersofastronomy.com, I do have a link for Ottawa, and you can pretty well judge from there when to see the space station. And you can make some money on the side too. I'll say, I bet you 20 bucks, the space station's coming. <laughs> Next slide, please. Not that you should bet, you should, don't bet. I'll be over 18. And here is the moon, if, if people follow their uh, lunar phases, when the uh, first quarter, full moon, last corner and the next lunation period or the next new moon and just distances because the moon does vary within about 50,000 kilometers of short and, and long distance from the Earth. Okay, next slide. And as, as Mike has, has mentioned, I do write for the national uh, site of the RSC. 
It's called The Sky This Month, and for March, I'm dealing actually with uh, Hydra, the water serpent, the various objects in Hydra, a lot of links to objects, another great place to, uh, to learn astronomy. Okay, next slide. So who remembers 20 years ago, Cosmos, like, you know, September of, uh, not that you want to date yourselves, this, uh, uh, September of 1980. It was a 13-hour episode by the great Carl Sagan, who really popped popularized astronomy, and sure a lot of people here began their, their journey in astronomy thanks to him. Well, I remember back then, of course, we didn't have any, any way of recording it, and I would ask my wife to leave the room and be very quiet as I put the cassette right, the, right next to the TV just to record these 13 hours. And now I can actually look it on, on my cell phone. Well, beginning this Sunday, check your local listings, Neil deGrasse Tyson is bringing back Cosmos after 34 years. So it's a, it's a series, I'm not sure how many episodes there will be, but the first will be this Sunday, I think it's at 8 or 9 o'clock. Again, check your local listings. So it'll be neat to see the di difference if you can get on YouTube between the old and the new. Okay, next slide. And I hope to see all of you's, well I can't really physically see you now, it's too dark, but I hope many of you will come back, enjoy tonight, and we hope to see you again next month. Thanks for coming. I'm really excited about the next speaker that we have tonight. My, my journey with uh, Dr. Sarah Simmons uh, started last fall, where I had heard that she had delivered a uh, riveting presentation at the Ontario Science Center. Um, in a, uh, it was working with the, uh, the Toronto RASC. I sent her an email. I said, would you be interested in coming possibly to Ottawa? And she responded so enthusiastically, I knew that we were on to something. Um, uh, it's been, as I said earlier, it's, it's, been, it's been a pleasure interacting with her through, through, through emails, and um, and uh, and and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be very impressed with her. Uh, Dr. Simmons is a member of the faculty of McMaster University in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, she is a um, a design instruct. She's part of a design and instructional team for integrated science, which is a four-year um, undergraduate program. Uh, a four-year program combining all areas of science, and which is taught through um, through research, and the, pre the program is uh, only one of its kind uh, in, in Canada. She brought the uh, program design to, to to Canada from the from the United, United Kingdom. She's also the director of the William J. McCallion uh, Planetarium in, in Hamilton, which uh, hosts a live presenter every uh, every week with a with a different uh, with a, of a different topic. I have to say, I spent a wonderful uh, afternoon with, with her, and, and I, I learned uh, quite a few things. Uh, she 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 is is reads uh, hieroglyphics, and uh, I was quite impressed that I was talking asking her questions about is there a past and present and future tense and that, and she said yes, and she explained it to me. And then um, we you know, we walked around the apartment buildings, went through the market and so forth. Then we drove by the war museum, and, and I said, you know, there's Morse code on the side of the building uh, there, and I, I I can't remember what it says. And Lest we forget. She reads Morris code as well. Okay, so she said, "Lest we forget." So at, at at that point, I started to feel really small. Okay, <laughs> now she I, I mentioned this to her earlier, and, and she, uh, she, she 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 you know she tried to make me feel better by saying you know, you know that uh, you know Morris code is not as, as not as involved as uh, hieroglyphics, but didn't help. I still felt small. <laughs> I, uh, I think I need to do some more homework. Um, her, her research area is the history of science, uh, in particular tonight's subject, which is um, uh, ancient uh, Egyptian astronomy. I'm thrilled she's here. It's been a, it's been a, something I've wanted to do for years. Um, please welcome Sarah Simmons. Good evening, bonsoir. Thanks very much for the introduction, Mike. It's an absolute pleasure to be here to talk to you about the subject which I love, ancient Egyptian astronomy. Now, our topic today reaches back to the beginnings of humans writing in hieroglyphs about what we now call astronomy, the activity of describing what we see in the sky and building a place for that knowledge in amongst our cultural activities, our language, and our worldview. Ancient Egypt is a culture that we all know something about. It has perhaps the most recognizable brand image of any civilization. We also know that it had a reputation, even in earlier times. Classical authors seem to believe that it was a repository of wisdom, especially astronomical wisdom. But of course, 
those authors were writing towards the end of the ancient Egyptian civilization. And today we're going to look quite a bit earlier. We'll go back as far as around 2000 BC. And we'll look at two types of astronomical document. In the title, I've called them maps and tables. So let's start with maps. The, the nearest thing we have to star maps from ancient Egypt don't look much like our modern star maps. And neither do they occur in locations where we would expect to find star maps, observatories, universities, etc. Many of them are underground. Here, for example, we're in a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and the ceiling is decorated with an astronomical diagram, a drawing depicting the objects that could be seen in the skies over ancient Egypt. The, the notion of stars appearing on the ceiling of temples and tombs comes from the idea that an Egyptian temple or tomb was a model of the universe. And of course, in, the, in a model universe, you'd expect to find the sky on the ceiling. The symbol that the Egyptians used for a star is a five-pointed star, and it's one of the earliest known hieroglyphs. Its use goes back to at least 3000 BC. Now, in temples and tombs over Egypt, all over star patterns, plain repeating star patterns, such as the ones that you see on the left here, are quite common. And we can see them in a, in a temple. And you might be able to make out in the black and white photograph on the right that this is a, a pyramid chamber. And the, the roof of the pyramid chamber, the ceiling, is covered in carved five-pointed stars. So those are all over patterns. But what happens when the representation of the sky gets a little bit more detailed? And instead of just star symbols, we have representations of stars and planets. Well, here is an astronomical diagram, an ancient Egyptian star map. So this, this star map occurs in a tomb, not of a pharaoh, but of a, a commoner. Senenmut. His name was Senenmut. He's an interesting guy. He was, he was an architect. He was advisor of a female pharaoh, a queen. And there's quite a lot of rumor in ancient Egypt that he was more than just her advisor. But however he did it, he got himself a really nice little tomb. <laughs> and he, he used the ceiling of the tomb. He decorated it with an astronomical diagram. This is the earliest surviving one that we have and it would be a really nice story if, if we, we thought that Senemut himself, with all his various interests and talents, had designed this thing. But we know that earlier ones existed. They just haven't survived to the present. So this is the earliest one we have. It's divided into, into two halves, representing the north and south part of the sky. So let's take a closer look at each half of this diagram. Here we have the northern half. The northern half, the main feature that stands out immediately, are the circles. These circles, there are 12 of them, they're labelled in hieroglyphs with the names of the lunar months. And all of these diagrams are slightly different, and this is the unique feature of Senenmut's diagram. He's the only one that has circles representing the lunar months. So we'll see one a bit later on which has the lunar months present, but not circles. In the middle, we have a group of different characters, a hippo, crocodiles, uh, pointy things, and right up at the top, a weird blobby shape that has horns, and I'll point that one out for you. That, uh, that foreleg of an ox is meant to represent part of an animal. And the hippo and the crocodiles form a group of figures that we call the circumpolar group. They represent the stars that rotate around the north circumpolar, the north pole of the sky, the north celestial pole. And we see this group repeated again and again in astronomical diagrams. Always accompanying this group are two processions of deities. 
Now, the figures, the hippopotamus, the crocodiles, we can think of those as constellations, and, and, and that's fine. But who these deities are on either side, they always occur, they're always in the same order, they're named, they have individual characteristics. We just don't know who they were. Maybe originally they represented the days of the lunar month and they mistakenly got associated with the northern stars. We don't know. So that's the, the northern half of the ceiling. Let's move to the southern half. Here again, we have more figures and a bit more text that you can see in the southern half of the ceiling. We read in ancient Egyptian usually from right to left, and that's the case in this ceiling. So reading from right to left, the first half is a list of star names. We call these these stars decans, and they're the calendrical or timekeeping stars of the Egyptian sky. And here's a whole list of them, and they finish up with two recognisable characters. There's a man in a small boat called a bark, and a lady in a small boat, and she seems to be holding onto a hat as if it's a, a windy day. These two figures on the left of the, of the highlighted area are representations of the, of the objects that we now call Orion and Sirius. Remember that Gary showed you Orion and Sirius in our present night sky? Well, here they are, represented by the ancient Egyptians. We can't say that that, that character, Sahu, its name in, in ancient Egyptian, is exactly the same as Orion, but it stars in that area. And we can say with reasonable certainty that the, the lady does represent the star that we call Sirius. So we have a list of stars, and then we have some planets. And here we have two planets. They are falcon-headed figures, again standing in small boats. And these are Jupiter and Saturn. Mars is missing. It's a feature of this particular family of, of astronomical diagrams that Mars is missing for some reason. Some people think that's terribly, terribly significant, and other people think they just, they just made a mistake. So Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, when he's present, all depicted the same way, falcon-headed gods in little, in little boats. Then we have a, another group of stars characterized by the, the constellation of two turtles. You can just make out the two turtles at the bottom there. They're more Deccan stars. And then at the end have Mercury and Venus. Venus is depicted as a heron or a phoenix. Mercury was thought to be an evil planet and so wasn't given a figure of his own. Its, its name is just spelt out in hieroglyphs. So this is how we decode uh, an astronomical diagram. And once you've learned the elements, you find that nearly all the astronomical diagrams have these same elements. They may look slightly different, but usually they're there. So let's try out this theory on a different ceiling. This is one that you can, you can go and see in Egypt. Um, and do go to Egypt because they really, really want you to go. They really need you to go right now um, to, to, to bolster the economy with the tourist industry. But if you go to this temple, the Ramesseum, the ceiling of the, the, the main part that's still standing is made out of stone slabs. And if you look very, very carefully, the, they're carved. And if you look even more carefully and zoom in, you will see that there is an astronomical diagram and it's easier to see in a, door, in a drawing here. This would have been painted originally, but the paint is all gone. So what have we got here? In the center, we've got a hippo and the, the foreleg with his horns. We've got some crocodiles there as well. It's the circumpolar group. Either side, two processions of deities, the circumpolar deities that accompany the northern stars. We also have, in the top register, a list of stars, the same ones, the, the Deccans, finishing up with the man in the boat, Orion, the lady in the boat, Sirius. Three planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Some more stars, including two turtles, two tortoises, and finally, two planets with Venus depicted as a bird. Along the bottom, we've got something which looks quite different from the Senenmut ceiling, but in fact, these are figures of the lunar months, not circles anymore, but figures. And the king, in this case, the very famous pharaoh, Ramesses II, 
himself offering to the gods of the lunar months. Therefore, we have all the same elements as Senemut, but we also have something different going along the top. Not only do we have lunar months, but we have the names of the months of the civil year as well. One of the features of ancient Egypt is that for the whole of the civilization, they ran two calendars in parallel, one based on the moon and one based approximately on the sun. We're going to need this idea of a civil calendar for later, so let's go into a bit more detail about that. The Egyptian civil year lasted exactly 365 days. It was divided into three seasons, named Achet, Peret, and Shemu. And each season had four months in it. And they, they don't seem to be very adventurous with their choice of month names with the civil calendar because it's just first month of Achet, second month of Achet, third, fourth, and then Peret, etc. Each one of these months had exactly 30 days in it lovely, neat, regular calendar. It meant that you could divide your 30-day month into three 10-day weeks. The first 10-day week of the month, middle one, and the last one. And we, we call these 10-day periods decades, which is really quite confusing because we usually think of decades being 10-year periods. But for, for the purposes of Egyptology, these 10-day weeks are called decades. So that makes up 12 months, 30 days each, 360 days. What should we do with the extra five days? Well, it's clear that the Egyptian civil calendar was a very neat calendar to use for accounting. And ancient Egypt was definitely a, a civilization full of bureaucrats who kept, who kept count of everything. And it was very nice and even to, to use the civil calendar with the 30 day months. But the five days at the end of the year were festival days. They were dedicated to different gods. They're called the epigominal days. Uh, the extra, five extra days on the year is the translation of what the Egyptians called these five days. So there's our, our civil calendar, which we're going to need. Now we've seen that in the ceiling with three registers in the Ramesseum, the civil calendar just appeared along the top of the diagram. But there's one astronomical diagram that has a greater relationship with the civil calendar, and it has another interesting and unique feature. We're going to go now from where we've been talking about in the, in the New Kingdom, around um, 13, 1200 BC, a bit more recently, to this artifact, which is from around 350 BC. It is not a, a, a temple or tomb, it's a sarcophagus, a stone sarcophagus, not for a human, not for a pharaoh, but for a bull, a, a, a sacred bull that was buried with full funeral rites. There are quite a number of these sequences of sacred bulls in Egypt that were, were selected because of, their, of certain markings and treated very well during their lives. And when they died, they would be buried, mummified, buried, properly and another young bull would be chosen to take their place. This one giant stone sarcophagus has carved on the inside of its lid where you'd expect the ceiling, the universe, the depiction of the sky, it has an astronomical diagram. And even though we're so much later in history, the format is still very much the same. Let's look at the south half first, it's better preserved. Here we have a sequence of star names and figures associated with the star names. This one goes all the way along the top row, and unusually, we're reading this time from left to right, just to confuse you, all the way along the top row and the beginning of the, of the lower row. And you can see the two people in, in the little boats at the end of, of the list, in the, in the second register there, a man and a woman, Orion and Sirius again. So here are Deccans our calendrical or timekeeping stars. We have two hawk-headed figures in boats. So here we have a diagram which harks all the way back to the early one, the, the first one of Senimut, in that it leaves out Mars, Jupiter and Saturn at present, but still they're per perpetuating the, the, the missing Mars pattern. 
some more stars, including the two turtles, and finally, Mercury and Venus. So, so far, all standard. But let's have a look at the other half of the sarcophagus lid. Oh, I should have put, pointed out here, the, the civil calendar is going along the top, as it was in the, in the Ramesseum version, along the top of the stars in this half. Let's turn it round, and unfortunately the bottom edge of the sarcophagus has been damaged, probably when people were trying to get into the sarcophagus to rob the, uh, the mummy of the bull. It might have been damaged, or maybe when it was being moved. But luckily, because we now know what we expect in the other half, we can reconstruct what was going on there. We have in the middle the circumpolar group of the northern stars, including the hippo, the bovine foreleg, crocodiles, etc. And on each side of that, we have the, the circumpolar deities, the two processions of gods that always accompany that northern group. But we also have something unique on this half of, of this diagram. What you can see here are little drawings of that foreleg, that northern constellation, in various different orientations. Let's take a closer look at, at this idea of the foreleg. The foreleg is the same group of stars that we call the Big Dipper, or people in the UK called the plough. And it appears that the ancient Egyptians had a similar idea of constellations as we do nowadays, the join the dots and then put a picture over the top idea. So we think of this thing, the Big Dipper, as being formed by, by this shape. The Egyptians clearly thought of it very similarly, just one small difference being joined together like that. And they called it the foreleg of the ox. That's the shape they thought it made. Interestingly, this part of the, of the ox was the choice bit that was used for offerings in, in temples. So the idea of a, of a foreleg, it's a special joint of meat, the, the best joint of meat, maybe. So we have our notion of this special group of stars being a constellation called the foreleg. And what we see on that bull sarcophagus are drawings of this group of stars in different attitudes throughout the civil year. So they're grouped in sets of three. And each set of three represents the orientations of the foreleg during a night in a period of the year. So this is the first one. It's in the first month of Akhet, so the first month of the Egyptian civil year. And it says, each, each representation of the foreleg is labelled beginning of the night, middle of the night, and end of the night. Now the problem here, as you astronomers will surely know, is that the Big Dipper is rotating throughout the night. And so the, the representation you see in this group of three can't possibly be, be true because it rotates from the beginning of the night to the middle of the night and apparently stays stationary until the end of the night. Well, that can't happen in reality. And unfortunately, if we look at the orientations through the rest of this table, we see that this is a very muddled document. It, it's not what we would find accurate, but that's not really the point. The point is that it suggests that somebody thought this was important, important enough that they'd made observations, they'd recorded them, however accurately or not, and then those observations had been incorporated into an astronomical diagram, and they turn up on this very high-status object, this granite sarcophagus of a bull. This is the only representation of this that has survived to the present and been found. And it just shows you the, the tantalizing problem which faces me as a researcher of this area. It suggests a whole set of observations. It suggests an idea of how the sky was moving, a desire to encapsulate that movement. 
it's a bit like our dipper clock that you can make nowadays, the, the, the big dipper moving around throughout the night. But by the time it's been copied and copied and copied perhaps many times before it appears on the sarcophagus, unfortunately, the, the accuracy or the meaning is very hard to reconstruct. And it's only survived because it's been carved into a granite sarcophagus, which must be one of the most difficult things to destroy that you could imagine. It's survived because it's in stone. It's not on a scrap of papyrus or wood. It's not perpetuated by word of mouth. And this is true of, of the study of, of astronomy in, in the ancient world. We have only a small amount of what would have existed. And we're constantly dealing with thinking about what has survived to the present and what must have must be missing and lost to us now. These astronomical diagrams, these star maps, we've seen how they, they go all the way from around 1500 BC all the way through to here, 350 BC on this bull sarcophagus, and indeed they go further through to Roman times, a span of about 1500 years of repeated use, slight modifications, but generally remaining the same. Here, for example, are a set of astronomical ceilings in a columned hall in the Roman temple of Hathor at Dendera in Egypt. The, this, this set of ceilings, carved and painted in Roman times and restored quite recently to see the beautiful colors, contain Egyptian elements, purely Egyptian elements. On the right there, we have the bull's foreleg with its horns. We have the hippo holding on to it behind. And then behind the hippo, we have a strange goat fish character. Well, that sounds kind of familiar. It's Capricorn. The zodiac has arrived, and it arrives from outside Egypt and is incorporated as an element in these later astronomical diagrams alongside the purely Egyptian circumpolar group. The most famous of these zodiacs incorporating both Egyptian ideas and new foreign ideas is the circular zodiac from that same temple, Dendera. The original is now in the Louvre Museum in Paris. And although this looks very different to the previous Egyptian astronomical diagram star maps that we've seen, it looks a lot closer to what we would expect. For one thing, it's circular. But in fact, when we break it down into pieces, we still find in the center the hippo holding onto a foreleg. Around the outer rim, figures representing the same group of stars, the Deccan stars, and especially included a, a figure of a man running, that's Orion, and instead of a woman, we've got a, a cow in a little boat, that's Sirius. The five planets that you can see with your naked eye are still there, but something's changed. They're now all presented as equals or equivalent. We've no longer got the grouping of three falcon-headed objects and the, the bird and just the, the label for Mercury and Venus. So the distinction which had been made between the planets, which we know are between the Sun and the orbit of the Earth, Mercury and Venus, and the superior planets, the planets that have their orbits outside that of the, the Earth, they, that distinction that has been present throughout Egyptian history in Greco-Roman times disappeared and all the planets were treated as a group of, of five similar objects instead of two groups, a group of three objects and a group of two. Quite an interesting development in itself. So we've reached the, the end of Egyptian history when it comes to star maps. And we saw how one of them, the bull sarcophagus, included an, an astronomical table of information. Let's move on to the second type of document. Oh, I forgot to say, the zodiac is there. All of the, all of the 12 constellations that we recognize are on that, that zodiac, again, from, from a foreign country, from the Mesopotamian region arriving in Egypt. There are a number of different sorts of astronomical tables from different time periods in ancient Egypt. 
And I chose just one to talk to you about tonight because it's the one that I'm working on right now. And I can tell you a little bit about recent developments in research in this area. We have to go back now, back in time, even further before the sealing of Senemut, back to around 2000 BC. And instead of looking at high status tombs like one in the Valley of the Kings or in big temples, we look for these objects on coffins. Coffins of humans, not bulls this time, um, and not of pharaohs and, and very high courtiers, but of noble people, pe wealthy people, but non-royal people usually. This is the type of coffin that I spend quite a lot of time looking at. It's a wooden coffin, rectangular. It's covered in hieroglyphs, inside and out. Again, this coffin is like a room in a temple or a tomb. It's a, a model, a miniature model of the universe. The texts around the coffin are a manual of instructions for how to navigate through the afterlife. They're spells for protection so that bad things don't happen to you. They go into quite a lot of detail about what the afterlife looks like and how you should behave in it, who you will meet. The text that we're looking for, because they're about stars, will be, where we expect to find them, will be on the inside of the lid. And again, in the mini universe of the coffin, the inside of the lid is the sky. The inside of the lid is sometimes plastered to a light coloured background and the texts are written on that surface. Usually they're ordinary spells from this body of literature called the coffin text, but on just a few coffins there are a table of star names. The table is divided into quadrants. There's a slice down the middle with four figures in it. And the four figures shown here, top to bottom, the sky goddess, her name is Nut, the foreleg, the, the dipper constellation, the Orion figure, and the, the figure for Sirius as well. Across the middle, horizontally, there's an offering text. And again, because we're in ancient Egypt, we're reading from right to left. Here's a different example, and perhaps on this one you can begin to make out that each box in the table finishes up with a, a star figure here painted in white. We can see that the, the, the table is divided into four quadrants by these texts running down and across, but it's made up of squares. Here's an example that's displayed nicely in a museum where you can actually read it. A lot of them are displayed so that the coffin lid is just above the coffin and you have to sort of bend over and peer underneath to see this. This one's the most comfortable one to look at. It's in a museum in Aswan in the far south of Egypt. If we zoom in on a portion of it, this one's written quite hastily. It's just black ink. It's written rather cursively. Um, this is a portion above the horizontal break and there are no big star symbols here which is a good thing actually because it, it condenses it all down now if you can pick out your favorite hieroglyphs and here I've picked out some fish a pair of fish you can see those fish move across the table in a diagonal pattern I've tried to bring that out in the in the graphic below with the with a pair of fish or indeed any of the other star names moving from left to right in a diagonal pattern, climbing up the table. Across the top of the table are dates. These, each, each column is labelled with one of those 10-day periods, the decades that make up the civil year. So we've got dates along the top and a table full of, of cells which contain star names. And the particular stars that are named in these tables are those Deccan stars that we saw in the astronomical diagrams. So it's really handy, if you don't read hieroglyphs, to be able to, to pull this into a kind of schematic idea of what's going on. So here's a, a, 
a diagram of what's happening in the table. We have the dates going along the top. We have 12 rows split in the middle by the horizontal offering text going across the middle. And we have a maximum of 40 columns. 36 of them are labelled with the 10-day periods of the civil year. And then we can have up to four columns on the end of, of the table as well. Here, each star name, I've labelled it with a number. So we start at the top right and say that's, that's star one. And star one only appears once. Star two appears below star one and at the top of the next column. And here you get the diagonal pattern, and this is why we call them diagonal star tables. And we can see that these stars go on through the, col the columns of the table throughout the year. Now, something interesting happens here. When you get to the 36th star, new star names are introduced. And here we conventionally use letters. To, to label the, the stars in this portion of the table. And those stars form a triangle area at the end of the table. So again, very, very prosaically, we call the, the stars here ordinary decans in the main body of the table. And the stars in this area are the triangle decans. And if you remember the astronomical diagram, the star list was in two parts. There was a, a larger part finishing up with a, Orion and Sirius. And then there were some planets, and then there was a small list of stars. The, sm the small group of stars at the end are the triangle decans, and here they are on this table. This is, this is the way that they were, were portrayed. Now we can use this schema, the way of labelling the different stars, to investigate the real tables that we have. We can, we can label each star with each star name with a number or a letter. And so we can look at a, a real coffin lid and record what's going on. Now, here you see a coffin lid which is on display in a museum in Tübingen in Germany. And here's the problem. The coffin lids were painted. Some of them were painted nicely. Some of them were painted really quickly. And they started at the, at the beginning of the table and they continued to draw columns on until they'd filled the coffin lid, and then they would stop. And that means that most of the star tables that have survived to the present day do not have the full possible 40 columns. We, we only have the first part. I suppose really it depends on how, how tall the person was that was buried in the coffin. The taller the person, the more columns we get. So it's a pity that there weren't more taller, <laughs> taller people. But, but really, it's a, it's a matter of quality. Sometimes they're beautifully laid out. There's lots of space, beautifully painted, but they finish very early. And it's actually, for my research, it's the, the last bit that's the most interesting and important bit. So it's, it's quite frustrating. So I suppose the question that will be in all your minds at the moment is, OK, so it's a table of star names. What is it for? And why do they occur on coffins? Well, for a start, I mentioned that coffins are covered with texts which tell the person what's going to happen to them in the afterlife, how to get the best out of that experience and survive it. So these star tables are appearing in a context which is not what we call scientific. It's what we would think of as being a religious context. That means that these star tables must have had some religious significance that would mean that some people, and we have only about 25 of these objects, but some people chose to have a manual of stars on their, their coffin lid. They're all early RASC members, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps these two represent a, a manual for behavior in the afterlife. In, in the earlier pe period, in Egypt where pharaohs were buried in pyramids, the pharaohs were thought to become stars, in particular the circumpolar stars in the northern part of the sky, the ones that go round and round but don't set. Well, these aren't the coffins of pharaohs, these are the coffins of noblemen, some of them were for women as well, 
but maybe by this time they, they were feeling they too could become stars, not the high status northern ones, but the stars which rose and sat, these timekeeping stars. The 12 rows have been interpreted as standing for the 12 hours of the night. And this is an interpretation which is borne out by a later version, the single version of this type of table that doesn't appear in a coffin, actually appears in a temple, and it labels the rose as ours. But was that the original understanding of the rose, or was that a later development? If, those table, if the, the rows in the table do represent ours, was this originally a timekeeping device? that you could read the hour of the night, not by the striking of a clock, but by the movement of stars throughout the sky. I arranged that specially. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't come with a manual, not even written in hieroglyphics. And we have no modern parallel to these things. So a lot of questions about these tables, the origin of the tables, who developed them, when exactly, what for, remain. So to finish, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my current research on these tables and to indicate why I think it's important to, to do this work. The majority of coffins which contain these tables came from near the modern town of Asyut in the middle of Egypt. Nowadays, you can't see any of these in situ. They've been excavated, they've been taken to museums. So my colleague Rob Cockcroft and I spent a month last year in Egypt working in museums, in the Cairo Museum, with some of the tables that are not on public display. You can only actually see one of these tables if you go to the Museum of Egyptian Antiquities in Cairo, the, the biggest collection of Egyptian antiquities in the world. They have eight of these, but only one of them is on display. And again, the way the coffin is displayed, you have to get down and kind of look up under to see the table. So I imagine that 99% of people never even know it's there. But we were, we were looking at some of the tables in storage and some of the tables that are on display. Uh, coffins that are on display but they're closed so you can't see them so we actually had them out of the cases and were able to look at them and we also looked in the in the Nubian Museum in Aswan. The easiest way though to go and to go and see these coffins is actually to look around in museums in Europe. Quite a few of them are on display so two in, in Egypt as I said one in the Cairo Museum one in the museum in Aswan but in Europe you can see one in Vienna, one in Turin and there's one not on display, T two in Hildesheim, of which one is on display, one I've shown you already from Tübingen is on display, there's also one in Paris, you can see the coffin, but it's closed, so you can't see the table. But as I said, not everybody notices a star table when they see one or recognise it, so even some of the ones on display had, have not or had not yet been described fully. For example, by 2012, it was known that there was a full table in a museum in a town called Malawi, not the country Malawi, but the, uh, a city in Egypt called Malawi. And here I've said Malawi, question mark, is there one? On display, apparently in a museum, people researching coffins from other points of view had remarked on it, but not recorded it in any way, no details, no photographs, etc. So Rob Cockcroft and I made the journey to Malawi while we were in, in Egypt. In, and this was in, we went in June 2013. In the museum, we had obtained permission to, to work and we began to look at the coffins to find out which one might have star tables on. So here we are in, in Malawi and here is the display of sarcophagi and coffins in that museum. Malawi is a place that tourists don't visit and indeed even people who'd worked archaeologically in the area couldn't tell me a lot about the museum. So this was a completely speculative journey we went on and we looked at each of the coffins. Is it this one? Is it that one? This one's closed. Is it going to be in there? Just our luck. But no, the final one that you can just, just see peeking, peeking out at the end of this photograph, photograph. That, that was the, the one, one we wanted to see. see. And the coffin lid was raised up a little and we could see underneath. But we weren't allowed to take photographs. 
So we sat and we stood and we craned over and we looked and we drew. We drew everything that we could see on the lid. You can see how it's supported up there. The bits underneath the wood, we couldn't see those bits, but mostly we could guess what was on there because of the pattern, the diagonal pattern. Now, by this time, after about an hour or an hour and a half of turning upside down to write things down, we needed a break. So we stood up and we took a look around the rest of the museum. We actually went back to one of the coffins. We'd looked at this one, peeked underneath. It looked blank in the lid. But then we took a closer look at the little piece of wood, the last baton that hel held the, uh, the coffin lid together. Um, it's, it's this little bit of wood here, crossing the planks underneath. And although the rest of the, the rest of the lid was plain white, we could just about make out on this lines and a few hieroglyphs. It's part of a star table. So we start craning over again and drawing that too. It's another fragment. We didn't expect it. Nobody knew it was there. So we had a wonderful time that day. It was fantastic. And we went home and we wrote it all up. And pretty soon, a couple of weeks after we got home, the second revolution in Egypt happened. We, we were quite glad that we weren't there at the time, but we continued writing and we submitted our first results for publication. And August 2013 rolled around and then the news came. That museum was completely looted. Every single movable object was taken out of it. The things that they couldn't move or didn't look valuable, the wooden coffins, were smashed. And you can see this is a, a picture in the middle of that devastation. And at first, the reports were that all of the wooden coffins had been burnt. And this chokes me up because my, my colleague, my Egyptologist colleague, Monica Hanna, who's actually from Malawi, it's her hometown, she went into the museum with the police and she took all the remaining objects, the fragments of objects, the bits of broken statue, and people were shooting into the museum while she was doing this. And they got these pieces out. And we're told that the two coffins with the bits of, of star table on them are in safe storage in a magazine nearby. But we haven't got proof of that. We hope this year to, to find out that they have been saved. But as, as of now, we don't know. And it just goes to show, 4,000 years these objects had waited with nobody being able to, well, they could read the hieroglyphs, but they didn't understand the importance of the astronomical document on them. And now they may be destroyed forever. We were there bare eight weeks before the, the museum looting. So really this has given us an enormous sense of urgency about the work we're doing. History of science is usually quite a sedate process because you think, well, it's not going anywhere. But unfortunately, sometimes it does. We are documenting all of these astronomical tables that we can find. And we're making these available to scholars and any interested people on our website, which is a database of astronomical tables. Here you can look up the different sources. You can see the schematics. We're getting permissions to publish photographs of the ones that, we, that we're allowed to, to show. But you can even see the the way that the star names were written and uh, compare them on each coffin. Apart from Orion and Sirius, which are part of, of, of these timekeeping stars, these decans, we don't know which stars these represent. But by looking into these documents and trying to piece together how they were observed, we can find out more information about astronomical activities in ancient Egypt. And just one final result, that coffin lid that was on display in Aswan, we found on it a um, thing that was, had not been recorded in its publication at all, hidden under a water stain. This star name here is a new one. This is a new Egyptian star, the first one found in at least 50 years, just hiding there. Everyone else had been working from black and white photographs, couldn't read, couldn't read the hieroglyphs. So we actually found a new star. And over the next year, we hope to add to that database all of the star maps, the astronomical diagrams of the type that I've been talking to you about. So you can visit the database here if you're interested and get in contact as well. And if you ever visit Egypt to see the pyramids and the tombs and the temples, please remember this talk and don't forget to look up. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.
so, 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 <laughs> thank you, Sarah. That uh, exceeded <laughs> my expectations. <laughs> Wonderful. We have time for uh, some questions here, and I'd like to start off with the first question. But just um, if you have a question, raise your hand. We have two runners with microphones. We'd like to make sure everyone uh, everyone uh, can can hear the question. So, so for me, I was I was wondering why for why forty columns? We've talked about decades as ten days. We talked about three hundred and sixty days. W why would they come up with forty? What, what is that? What's the significance of that? Well, 36 of them are the 10 day periods, so that makes 360 days. And this is, this is the bit that's, that really gets quite technical because the year isn't 360 days long. It's 365 and a little bit. So the bit where you finish the numbered ones, one to 36, you'd expect really to be able to use one again, but it's not good enough. Because the, the solar year is 365 days, your Deccan 1 is, is half a period off. So that's why you have to start adding those new star names with letters on at the end. Then when you get to the last column, it's almost full of those. The column on the far left, the 40th column, was labelled for the five extra days of the year. So it's a half, half width, if you like, column. Now, that's a list of all 12 of these triangle decans. The three columns beforehand are just a list of all the other ones. So you get decans 1 to 12 in the 37th column, 13 to 24, in the, and so on. So you've got a list of all of the stars in those four columns. Terrific. Any questions from anyone? OK, Sylvie. Oh, lots of questions. Just give us a chance. Thank you for our marvelous talk. Um, my name is Janet Tulloch. I'm a religious studies scholar at Carleton. Um, I work in the area of early Christianity and uh, Greek and Roman uh, material culture. Um, I was interested in the bull sarcophagus um, you mentioned, but really didn't uh, give us very much of a clue of what that middle line of offerings was about. Um, and so I'm curious if uh, you're able to interpret that and what it says. Thank you. Sure. On the astronomical diagrams, the, the text that surrounds the diagram is usually nothing astronomical at all. It usually contains the names and titles of the, the reigning king of the time, usually the builder of the monument or sometimes the owner of the, the sarcophagus. The, the band of offering text which goes down the middle of the star tables, the diagonal star tables, the, an offering text is a, is a formulaic text which is asking for gifts for the dead person, actually the, the car spirit of the dead person. And usually it will, it will ask for these um, gifts to be given by Anubis or usually Osiris, the god of the dead. However, the offering text that's used in the middle of the star tables actually is asking for offerings from the gods of the sky, so the names of the Deccans themselves and those important celestial figures, the, the goddess Nut, the foreleg, asking for gifts for them. So it's unique to those star tables, not what we would recognise as astronomical uh, in, in the scientific way, but asking astronomical figures as gods. Hi, so uh, my name is Frank Marshall, I'm one of the members. Um, I'm just wondering, um, what did the Egyptians make of the changing sky? So what did they make of meteor showers or uh, comets maybe even? Mm. Uh, do you have any ideas about that? And also, why does Mercury have a negative connotation? Okay, um, Mercury negative connotation, it's associated with the god of chaos, storms, evil, Set or Seth. Um, quite why it's, it's evil, we don't know, but the, there's a, a story that's recounted about it in a, in a New Kingdom funerary text, which is that the, the sun god captured it and imprisoned it in the north of the sky and tied it up to a stake and put lots of fierce animals, hippos and, and, and crocodiles, around it to prevent it wandering to the south of the sky. So that's an ex explanation of why those stars go round and round and round the, the North Celestial Pole. OK, what was the first? Comets. The comets. Comets and meteors. Yeah, it, it's interesting in Egyptian astronomy, the bits that are kind of missed out. 
Um, things like eclipses are not are not present. Uh, the, the moon is there as, in terms of lunar months, but not depicted in the astronomical ceilings like, like other things. And the transient phenomena are more or less absent. There's one very interesting bit in a piece of, of literature where there's a talking snake, and he's describing that his family was wiped out by a fire from, that fell from the sky. Sounds incredibly like the extinction of the dinosaurs and asteroid impact and all sorts of things. Very, very strange. Um, and I think there's another account of perhaps a meteor being seen by the, the army at one, one stage, but nothing systematic. Sylvia, on your side? Yeah, on my side. Gary, again. Now, you said there were 12 houses of the zodiac that they used for, well, astrology back then. Of course, we know there are 13 constellations on the ecliptic. And finally, astrology has moved to 13, though we just being the 13th. Was it just an unlucky number that they didn't want to use 13, or because of recession, or why well, was only 12? Well, whoever decided it was 12, it wasn't an Egyptian, <laughs> because the, the 12 figures arrive from, from abroad, and they were just, just 12 at a time. The notion of whether the ancient Egyptians were aware of precession is a controversial one. You will find some people saying that they were aware of it. They certainly could have observed it if they were looking at star movements in this way. They could have, for example, worked out a lot earlier that this, their civil year wasn't exactly a solar year and so forth. It's very difficult. The, the Egyptian civilization provides a lot of written material for an ancient civilization of its time, but it doesn't always provide the details that we want to know about. <laughs> I'm Haley, and I was wondering how you learned um, the hieroglyphics. Well, Haley, I've always been interested in hieroglyphics since your age or maybe before. But in order to study this area, I had to learn them. It was such a chore. I spent a year um, traveling down to University of Oxford and studying with somebody whose research area is Egyptian language. And so, this was obviously a very onerous task, and I hated every minute of it. <laughs> Honestly, they say that you, you, when the things that happen when you're young, they're the, they're the best things. Honestly, spending a year just learning hieroglyphics, wonderful, wonderful. But yeah, you learn it like any other language. You learn, you learn to read the script, and then, of course, there's a language underneath that, nouns and verbs and adjectives and, and tenses and so forth. And your tutor sets you examples and you work through them and make mistakes. It's just the only thing is you can't really pronounce it very well because we don't know how it sounded, so we just guess. <laughs> okay, two two more quick questions, uh, Sylvie, and one for the uh, length of the uh, civilization, the Egyptian civilization. I'm just wondering how these symbols evolved over time. Did, at the very beginning, was there much of a difference towards the end? <laughs> the Egyptian language was around for at least 3,500 years. And yes, the language evolved hugely. And in fact, when you're, when you're learning to read, you, you start in a, in a period of, of language called Middle Egyptian, where there's lots of literature and it's, it's regular. But then you have to learn either forwards or backwards to, to visit other parts of the language. So yes, it changed, the language changed, the script changed a lot. Last question over there. I'm with a, a Christian historical studies group as well, and uh, your lecture is fascinating indeed, and you're absolutely right. There's so much more we don't know than what we do know. A few years ago, my wife and I were at the Great Museum in, in Cairo, at Terrier Square, uh, before the uprising, and I remember telling my wife that, uh, I said, look around in this Great Museum. Most of the objects here are contrary to radical Muslim law. And I told her, I says, you know, if radical Muslims ever take over Egypt, this museum is in grave danger. And uh, it appears that the prediction was true. You know, I really do believe that people like you uh, should be looking for international protection for the great heritage that is in Egypt, uh, that religious wars don't destroy those, uh, those museums. So, uh, so God bless you for doing that, and I hope you're... Uh, you're going to lobby for some protection 
uh, for those museums that, uh, that these things will be preserved uh, for uh, world heritage. And I'd like to say that there are many, many Egyptians who agree with you and who are working and, like Monica Hanna, are, are acting to save Egypt's heritage because it, it belongs to the Egyptian people and, and to the world. So there are a lot of people inside Egypt as well who are very much aware of the value of what they have. Okay. Th thank, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everyone. I'm so sorry we have to we have to cut it off here. Sarah will be here um, during the break and, and also um, uh, at the end of the meeting here. Uh, Gary, can you come for a second? Um, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, we we uh, we'd like to give we'd like to give you just a token of our appreciation um, to, and thank you for coming all this way. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thanks for preparing it. Uh, we have a, a meteorite uh, gift for you. Uh, and, uh, thanks again. Okay, thanks, Sarah. On behalf of the Ottawa Centre, I'd like to thank you for an excellent, excellent talk to open our eyes of how astronomy began. And I can tell by the passion in your voice, especially on that nasty bit of vandalism, how passionate you are about um, these little squiggles that uh, we know, no, know nothing of pretty well, but uh, you open our eyes to it. So, again, thank you very much and take this on our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just before we go to break, I want to do one last thing. Uh, Monica Ferguson. Monica, could you come up to the front, please? <laughs> so you may remember Monica Ferguson. She, she delivered that um, spellbinding um, presentation, uh, Maps of the Cosmos, last uh, in, in February. And Monica, I didn't have a chance to say thank you. To, come on up. Come on up. <laughs> didn't, have a, didn't have thanks to say, say, didn't have an opportunity to say thank you to you um, because everyone was crowded around you. You had a wonderful display. Um, uh, Gary as well, please. Um, we'd like to give you um, also a, um, a meteorite as well. As a, I just said book. before, same thing. <laughs> but, but no, but, <laughs> get over here. Oh, but, but again, thank you for really opening up our eyes to, what did I say was the word after that? Oh, yeah. But no, truly enjoyed last, last month. Um, it's uh, stuff that, that none of us really partake in, but I'm sure a few of us walked away wanting to know more. And through your... Uh, diligence, uh, we opened up our eyes. I was, it was an absolute honor. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Mike, anybody else? No, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Okay, folks, it's IC 925 at 9. We're going to have a, a 10 minute break for, um, we'll come back and meet at 9.35. Um, and uh, the next slide. If you're interested, here are some of the membership uh, benefits uh, locally and nationally. All right. Any questions, come see us. So 10 minutes, please. Thanks. OK, let's get started, everyone, here. Um, the, uh, um, the next segment is uh, observation reports, where uh, members of our group and some, uh, and some uh, associated group, uh, astronomy groups um, are, are going to be sharing their uh, reports. Uh, first up is, uh, I believe, uh, Eric uh, LeMay. Uh, Please, next slide, Gary. Well, oh, yes, and I should say, by the way, we have a surprise mystery guest that uh, you'll see. Eric? Eric? Hi there. Um, so this is the Andromeda Galaxy. I took this, um, uh, I took this back in August of uh, 2013 at the North Frontenac Dark Sky Preserve. Um, so Andromeda uh, lies about two and a half million light years uh, away from us. Um, you've also got a couple other galaxies in the frame here as well too. You've got, um, oh sorry, what did I do? Talk about it. There we go. Um, so you've got M32 here as well too, another satellite galaxy of, uh, of the Andromeda Galaxy. And you've got uh, M110 here. Um, so when I processed this image, uh, well, first of all, the exposure was about two hours of exposure. Um, I used my uh, Takahashi FSQ-106, um, a Starlight Express uh, SXVR H18 for this. And I used my focal reducer to achieve F3.64. Uh, um, 
when I went to go process it, I noticed that there was a lot of, uh, there was a, a huge light gradient from the bottom left to the top right, and it was uh, a little difficult to, to get rid of that. I used um, Pix Insight, and through a few of the tools that are in that program, I found it was a lot more useful than, uh, than processing it with uh, Photoshop. Um, and one of the things that I uh, struggled with was to get rid of all of the stars so I could have just the galaxy. But then I thought about it a little more and kind of realized that uh, after Gary had mentioned to me about finding a bunch of the clusters in the actual galaxy, that by removing the stars, I would also be removing a lot of the, the content in the galaxy as well too, namely the, the globular clusters. Um, so what I did is I just took a crop here and so everything that you see here, all the, it's a whole bunch of little small dots. It's, it's, they're not all visible from wherever you are in the audience there, but it, this is just some of them as well too. There's hundreds of them. So if I were to remove all of those globular clusters, it would really change what the actual object looked like, right? So um, yeah, so I decided to do this instead. I figured it would be a little more interesting to, to look at that than the alternative. Can I mention something? Sure. So I can be heard. <laughs> Just for perspective, it's worth considering that each of these little tiny dots is a globular star cluster that contains anything from, say, 10,000 to perhaps a million stars like our sun, each little tiny dot. So that'll put the whole thing into perspective. And for those who aren't familiar with the night sky, the Andromeda galaxy, in this picture here where we look at it from the upper left to lower right along its length, you could fit five full moons along that. So it's actually very large in the sky. You don't need a big telescope to see it, but it takes photographs like this to see the incredible detail. To the eye, it's an almost detailless fuzzy blob with a bright center fading off to the edges. Just a little perspective. Thank you, Mike. I was just about to say that. <laughs> well, stick a fork in me, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Your work continues to be impressive. Uh, Jim Thompson, please. <laughs> hey, uh, these are a couple of moon shots I took um, in the middle of last month. Uh, starting at the top, um, one of my favorite craters to, uh, to look at, Anaxagoras. Very young crater, only about 450 million years old. Um, that's relatively young. Uh, you can tell by the bright uh, ray system coming out from it. And the, uh, I was surprised to see how far into the crater I could see this evening, and that's because of the libration that particular night. It was so leaning forward that you can actually see the North Pole. This crater here is uh, Peary. This is Beard and Peary. And the rim right here of this crater Right about there is the North Pole of the Moon. So we can actually, on this evening, see past the North Pole to the far side of the Moon to uh, one of the Russian named craters, which we never see, uh, Rosh Destvensky. I'm, I'm kind of rusty in my Russian. Uh, next, please. So the, uh, my real focus for the evening was to try to catch some uh, lunar domes. And uh, this is one of my nemeses, uh, Mons Runker. It's a very large volcanic dome. It's about uh, 70 kilometers across and about uh, just over a kilometer high. A massive volcanic feature. But its, um, its position and its uh, color makes it really difficult to get a good image of it. So I think I didn't do too bad on this evening. And much easier to see are the two uh, lunar domes down here. Uh, Gruthazen, get these right, this is Gruthazen Gamma and Gruthazen Delta. You can actually see the caldera right in the middle of uh, the one on the left. So that was a pretty good shot. Uh, next, please. Uh, another one of my f uh, favorite areas to observe is the area around Aristarchus, another very young crater again about 450 million years old. Uh, very bright. Um, I really like the, the detail in the crater that came out today that you can see some terracing, 
see the central peak. And what really surprised me was for the Schroeder's Valley, everybody, well, most people who have observed the moon have seen it. But what you haven't seen is the continuation of the valley. There's a central valley that runs through the middle and continues out here. And you can just see the shadow of it there. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a faint shadow, which uh, rarely, rarely see. So I was happy with that. Um, next, please. And the, uh, the last uh, lunar dome feature that I was trying to catch, it's uh, along the same line, luckily, was the Marius Hills. So this is Crater Marius, um, Kepler, and Enk, which I believe you're going to hear a lot more about shortly. Um, this region here looks kind of pimpled and bumpy. They are actually hundreds of uh, volcanic domes. It's an area about uh, one to two kilometers across or around. Um, these domes are 200 to 500 meters high. Oh, sorry. I read that wrong. My notes are hard to read here. The area is actually 300 kilometers across this area. Each dome is one to two kilometers across. So each of these little bump features are about one to two kilometers across and two to 500 meters tall. Now one thing that I was also trying to catch, I have been unsuccessful so far, is uh, Rima Marius. It's a, it's a valley that runs somewhere in here. And um, I just didn't pull it out tonight, or on that particular night. Maybe when the sun is coming from the other direction, it will come out better, but uh, I didn't quite get it that night. That's it. Thank you. Oh, sorry, that's not it. OK, I'm switching hats now. The uh, Ottawa Astronomy Workshop Series, uh, this is just a reminder that we are having the, uh, the next one next Friday. Um, the topic is your favorite astronomy book. We're looking for uh, people who have a favorite astronomy book, whether it's um, um, a novel or if it's more of a, a scientific book, um, to share it with us. Share it with not only the members of the group at the workshop, but also we broadcast live on Night Sky Network, and you can share it with people uh, all over the globe, live. So if you are interested in participating, uh, contact me, please. Um, this is my email address. There's also a website where I have all of the past workshops, uh, slide presentations posted, if you want to kind of see what we've done in the past. Uh, it's very informal. We just kind of sit down around a table with an overhead projector, and we just talk about astronomy stuff. So um, yeah, the more the merrier. OK, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Jim, Jim really doesn't take enough credit for this, the, the, uh, the workshop series here. It, it's a different format than what we have tonight, but uh, you, you more of a relaxed uh, question and answer. Uh, Jim, it's uh, your, your inspiration here. It, it, you're really an inspiring fellow with what you've done. Okay, the mystery guest. I've mentioned before uh, Mike Wirfs. And uh, Mike, he runs a bed and breakfast with his wife in Baja um, Peninsula, a very uh, remote area. And we are delighted to have Mike Wirth uh, join us tonight. So Mike, if you could uh, join us, please. So hi, everybody. Um, a while back, I sent Mike a few of my solar images, or at least the ones that I thought turned out the best so far. And uh, he thought it'd be, it would be a good idea if I did an audio file to present them for you. Yes, a new Astro toy, a Lunt 152mm dedicated hydrogen alpha solar telescope. When uh, my friend Attila Danko heard that I, that I actually managed to get one of these, he was amazed because I've been pestering my, my wife for years now to, to be able to get one. I tried all sorts of um, excuses like, oh, it would be good for the business, blah, blah, blah. But, but wives have BS meters, and she saw right through that. So I guess the advice is gentle, persistent pestering for a period of years is, is the way to go. So let's start with the first image. Um, some, some of you may recall that in January there was a really big sun, sunspot group uh, visible 
visible even to the naked eye with a with a piece of welder's glass. It was known as AR 1944, and uh, here you can see it's just starting to ro rotate into view. Um, there's quite a few filaments. Those are those are prominences on the face of the, of the sun, and uh, on the edge, you can't see anything because at that point I didn't have the camera settings right and I had the, the gamma set too low, so there should be some spicules on the edge, but you can't see them in, in this image. You may also notice that um, the image isn't truly totally hydrogen alpha. It has aspects of white light as well. This is because uh, the Lunt telescope is pressure tuned. As you tune it in, it, it increases the air, air um, pressure against the etalon and, and tunes in the hydrogen alpha. But a couple of the O-rings weren't, they weren't working proper, properly. They let go, they weren't. So I wasn't able to, to tune in to the hydrogen alpha uh, spectrum 100%. I'm still waiting for some replacement O-rings, so hopefully soon I'll be able to do images totally in hydrogen alpha. But this one, this one had some really good seeing and, and the level of detail was pretty amazing. Uh, given that the sun's altitude really isn't that high in the sky at that at that uh, time of the year in January, even though we're at 30 degrees latitude here in Baja California, the camera that I'm using for all of these images uh, is a Point Grey uh, Grasshopper 3, a USB 3 camera. It's uh, really sensitive, good quantum efficiency, um, a big chip size, which is perfect for the moon and the, for the sun for imaging, and it has a fast frame rate. It has 26 does 26 frames per second, which is really good because it means you can gather a lot of frames in a relatively short time, time frame. So the next image is of, of this large sunspot group, AR 1944, as it was passing basically the, the middle of the sun uh, facing towards the Earth. And you can see this one's really mostly white light. There is some aspects of hydrogen alpha above and below the largest sunspot there, but there's some really cool detail in the umbra area of the sunspot. All of these images are stacks of around 150 to 200 frames done with um, uh, AutoStacker, which is a freeware um, stacking program, and AVI Stack is also a really good one. Registax, too, Registax doesn't really work that well for me, so I mainly use those, those other programs for all, all of my, my stacking of images. The next image is uh, sort of a, a, a close-up crop of a M-class uh, prominence that happened on January 17th, and uh, I just sort of did a region of interest box on the on the camera, which takes it down to about 1200 by 1200 and gives you a little bit faster frame rate. So this is uh, recorded for 30 seconds, and it really it, it, you need to do a, a recording very. Uh, uh, short time frame, like 30, 40 seconds, to, to really be able to freeze all of the motion, which, uh, which uh, happens in, in the uh, spicules that you can see here on, on, on the edge of the solar limb. This is why having a camera which, uh, which can do a really fast frame rate, rate is, is, is kind of crucial, so that you can get all those you know, frames in, in, in the best moments of seeing in a really, really short time frame. And the last image is another uh, prominence. Um, you can see a little de uh, detached bit uh, to the left uh, there on the, on the bottom, and it, it's really quite amazing how how quickly the, the the shape changes over a really short period period of time. You can you can really see see that happening, which is quite exciting since there's not too many things in astronomy that you can see movement in. So hopefully soon I'll be able to get my, my scope working in, in, in really in true hydrogen alpha, 100% hydrogen alpha light. And uh, as the sun gets higher and higher in the sky, as spring and summer progresses, then maybe I'll be able to supply some, some very high-res solar images for you to show in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. I know you're walking, uh, watching now. That's uh, that's awesome. Uh, since um, Mike sent that those slides to us, he, he followed up with another another uh, image here that you're seeing, and he received the O-ring. He solved the uh, pressure tuning problem, and uh, you can see hydrogen alpha is much more prominent here, particularly in the uh, in the prominence on the at uh, about eight, eight o'clock there. I find this image, this last image, very interesting. When I when I received it. Um, 
I, uh, what, what went through my mind was just the sheer size of things. So just how, how massive is, is, the, is the province? Well, let's, let's consider this. So I figured this is about, um, this, that uh, top edge is about, uh, the image is about three quarters of the radius of the, of the sun, there about, you know, give or take. Um, since the radius of the sun is 700,000 kilometers, then three quarters of this length is about 525,000 kilometers. I, I estimate the prominence here to be about um, one tenth of that distance, so about 52,500 kilometers, give or take. Now, since the diameter of the Earth, the diameter of the Earth is um, 12,700 kilometers, we could fit uh, four Earths uh, side by side um, within this prominence. Uh, one of our guest speakers next month is going to be Ken Whitnell, and Ken is, he's, he's has a very impressive solar uh, uh, setup, um, and he's told me he's seen promises, prominences that stretch uh, out to 300,000 kilometers. The sun is, this, everything about the sun um, is, 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 is big. So, <laughs> um, so th 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 that's it for the images. Um, we're, we're, our next speaker is um, uh, Simon Hamder, and with images from um, Mike uh, Wirfs. Um, just a time check, everyone. We're running about uh, 10.35, so I apologize for running late, but this is a special night, and I hope you understand. Simon. Okay. I'm prepared to bet dollars to donuts that everyone in this room knows what an impact crater is and knows that they're circular in shape when seen from directly overhead, unless, of course, the impactor that formed the crater struck the surface at a very low oblique angle. Next one, please, Chris. After all, you only have to take a cursory look at the near side of the moon, our own moon, that's the side we can observe from Earth with our own backyard telescopes, to see that this must be true. But are you sure it's true? What if I told you it's false? and that most impact craters do indeed have a circular plane, a plan view, immediately after impact, but that very rapidly after the initial impact, that circular shape evolves and in many cases becomes polygonal. And when I say many cases, I mean up to 20% of the impact craters on the moon. What if I told you that instead of growing old gracefully, impact craters actually grow old polygonally? Now tonight, I'm going to try and convince you of this using examples of generally well-known and therefore well-observed impact craters visible to amateur astronomers on the near side of the moon. And I'm prepared to bet that many of you have already looked at most of the examples that I'll be presenting tonight, and I'd be very interested to know how many of you have seen these craters as circular in outline. Next one, please, Chris. My partner in crime for this presentation is Mike Wirtz. Evening, Mike. One of the world's leading lunar images, images, as you've been told. Now, Mike is very well known to many of us here. He was based just outside of Ottawa before moving to clearer skies in Baja, Mexico, accompanied, of course, by his telescope equipment and cameras, and, of course, now his new telescope. Next one, please. His superb images of the moon's surface are regularly featured on the Lunar Picture of the Day website, and I would strongly recommend that you check them out in the original resolution, because in the original resolution, they are amazing. Next one, please. Now, here's one of the quintessential lunar impact craters, Tycho. Doesn't, I don't really need to point out where it is. It's right there. Note that all the slides that I show you will be accompanied by um, a, an insert at top right with a flashing uh, green indicator to tell you where on the moon we're actually looking. Now, what do we see when we examine an impact crater like Tycho? We see the crater floor, in this case with its central peak, right there. It's readily distinguished from the raised crater rim, which you can see around here. But the rim itself is made of two very different components, terraces, that's these things down here. And scarps, that's these bright things right at the outside. Now, the terraces are best seen on the east side of the crater, in this case, where they look like the pictures you might have seen in travel magazines of rice paddies decorating the steep hillsides in many Asian countries. The difference being that in the case of Tycho, these terraces result from an orderly collapse of the bedrock that formed the original inner wall of the rim as it slid into the initial impact cavity. Elsewhere around the rim, around here for example, it's more difficult to make out the distinctive terrace structure. This is because the collapse mechanism was perhaps more chaotic 
resulting in large, mess, uh, large scale messy landslides instead of neat and tidy terraces. Whatever the mechanism of flow of the collapsing material, terraces and landslides alike can leave scars in the outer part of the crater rim, essentially tall, steep cliffs known as scarps. And that's what this is here. This is an example of one of those tall, steep scarps. Now, if you now consider the base of the collapsed rim material separately from the outer perimeter of the impact crater, so here's the base of the collapsed material and here's the outer rim of the, of the impact crater, both are approximately circular in outline in the case of Tycho. Next one, please. However, when I first saw this image taken by Mike Wertz of the flooded, and when I say flooded, I don't mean flooded with water, but flooded with basalt lava, impact crater Lacus Mortis, I was puzzled, really puzzled. Although the lavas that flood the crater almost reach to the top of the crater rim, you can clearly see that the outer perimeter of the impact crater is a polygon. Look, here, and another, and another, and another. It's a polygon bounded by five preserved straight walls of approximately equal length, separated by a characteristic internal angle, that's this angle here between two of the straight segments, of 120 degrees. By the time I finish this talk, you will be sick of me saying 120 degrees. I suggested in a talk that Mike and I gave here back in 2009 that Lacus Mortis was in fact hexagonal in shape. Not only hexagonal, but symmetrically hexagonal in shape. Sarah, did you arrange for this one as well? <laughs> but I was completely stumped at that time. I still had no idea as to how this might have happened. Notice, by the way, over here, down in the corner, the straight sides on Hercules crater, and we'll come back to that later in the talk. Polygonal impact craters were first identified on the moon in the 1800s, so what I'm talking about here is nothing new. You might assume, as many have, that the impacts simply exploited pre-existing fractures in the bedrock. And this was indeed the fundamental conclusion of a recent PhD thesis done in 2009 from Finland. However, there's no sign of hexagonal fracture patterns in the area, or anywhere else on the moon for that matter. And in any event, from a geological perspective, hexagonal fracture patterns, especially symmetrical hexagonal fracture patterns, are difficult to impossible to produce tectonically, which I mean by sort of pushing and pulling the rocks around. Next one, please, Chris. Instead, during the 1950s and 1960s, scientists tended to attribute the straight sides that they saw on some lunar craters to pre-impact quadrilateral, that's a fancy term for diamond-shaped, conjugate fracture patterns known as the lunar grid that do indeed seem to occur all over the moon and are probably responsible for the diamond shape of the Aristarchus Plateau that contains the famous Schroeder's Rill that Jim Thompson just showed you. So these red lines here, um, they are the, 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 the uh, diamond-shaped fracture pattern. But four fractures do not define a hexagon. And in addition, this ad hoc explanation, which it is, would not apply on other rocky planets and even ice moons, where these hexagonal crater patterns also form. Next one, please, Chris. So I started scanning the moon and lunar literature, looking for other examples of non-circular impact crater shapes. And I found them everywhere. Copernicus has to be one of the all-time favorite craters for amateur lunar observers. But it wasn't until I started asking myself about Lacus Mortis, which we just saw in a previous slide, that I realized that I'd looked at Copernicus many times, but I'd never seen it. Next one, please, Chris. And hit it a second time. Here still is Copernicus. It's a, it's a, it's a different one of Mike's um, uh, images. It just helps me with my talk. Again, look at the crater rim and separate the base of the collapsed terraces and landslides from the outer rim scarps. The base of the collapsed material here has a perfectly circular shape, but the outer scarps clearly define a, de a perfect symmetrical hexagon with six straight sides, one, two, three, four, five, six, separated by 120 degree internal angles. Next one, please. Even Plato, the quintessential flooded circular crater, has local scarp faces that are pretty straight on the left. Look at this one over here. And this one down there. 
Now, I'd never call Plato hexagonal or even polygonal. Rather, it seems to represent something intermediate or, if you like, hybrid between the shapes of Tycho and Copernicus. Next one, please. Just so you don't think this is an optical illusion, here's three relatively small impact craters, pretty much face on with no optical distortion due to foreshortening due to location, all of which show clear hexagonal morphology, especially Enki, which is even drawn hexagonal in Ruckel's famous lunar atlas. Next one, please. I want now to look at a set of four highly popular impact craters located in the lunar highlands near the middle of the visible lunar surface, so we can yet again observe them with a minimum of distortion. So you'll see here, here's Ptolemaeus, that's this one here. This is Alphonsus, down here is Azakel, and here, although I've misspelt it, oh no, I got it right in this, in this version, Albategnius is uh, this one here. Next one, please, Chris. Now, here's Ptolemaeus. It's a very obvious flooded hexagon with those internal 120-degree angles in the style of Lacus Mortis. The lava within the crater has covered the collapse features of the crater rim and the lower parts of the outer rim scarps. Next one, please. Neighboring Alphonsus, this time uh, uh, imaged actually by Wes Higgins, shows a similar overall form to Ptolemaeus. But I can only hold a ruler to three sides. I think I can justify that that's straight, that's straight, and that is straight. The rest of it, I don't know. And I can therefore only really point to two clear-cut internal 120-degree angles. Next one. Albategnius is similar in form to Ptolemaeus with a good hexagonal shape and internal 120-degree angles, despite having been heavily battered. Notice that the flooding of the crater here was less extreme than for Ptolemaeus, as is evidenced by the fact that the central peak is preserved, there. And the visible upper levels of the collapsed material, you can see the upper levels of the collapsed stuff here as well. Azakel is the fourth member of this quartet of impact craters, here again shown in another Wes Higgins uh, image. I want to draw your attention here to the very obvious scarps on the south side, here, here, and here. And their absence on the well-illuminated east side. I don't see the scarps there. They're not there. I think they're also absent from the north and west sides, but the illumination isn't definitive in this image. Now, looking at just the south and east sides that I just pointed out, I'm struck by the angularity of the network of long, discrete scarps here on the south side. That's the angularity I'm pointing to there. Versus the smooth arc of the landslide material, both at the foot of the scarps and in the east where the scarps are absent. The scarps are big, whereas the fracturing within the landslide material occurred at a much smaller scale. And I think this key observation is going to provide the principal clue to understanding polygonal crater outlines. Next one, please. Using Copernicus as an illustration, this is how I, things, I think things might work that scarps are major fractures in bedrock. They're in bedrock, not in loose, unconsolidated material. And just again, look, here are three scarps which are very obviously illuminated. Fracture mechanics in bedrock is very complicated, but it can be understood if you'll allow me to simplify, which I know you will. Let's look at the simplest crack possible. It could be any size, and it could be in your seating plaster at home. So don't try to directly match this overly simplified diagram on the right to the complexities of Copernicus itself. The situation about midway along this, crater, uh, along this crack is pretty simple. A tensile or pulling apart stress indicated in red acts to open the crack. As you might expect, once the strength, or if you like, the resistance to initial fracturing of the material, be it bedrock or be it plaster, is overcome, the opening of the crack tends to relieve or relax the driving stresses in that midsection of the crack. But the crack has a finite length. That's how I've drawn it. So by definition, the crack has ends, or tips, more technically. And this is where life can get really complicated. And this is where I'm going to simplify things dramatically. Sigh of relief from the audience. The complication is this. The simple fact of a crack opening and propagating along its length to its tips induces new stresses at the tips themselves. 
This is in addition to the regional stresses that made the crack in the first place. As long as the crack stays simple, and that also means straight, the new stresses induced by the crack itself will help the crack grow longer and propagate. Just watch a fracture in your windshield as it starts something small and then suddenly, woof, goes right across your windshield. But if the growing crack tip tries to bend, the different, stre stress, different stress fields will be induced at the crack tips, which may make it harder for the crack to propagate and grow longer. My simple explanation here applies to tensional cracks, but the same general principles apply to sliding cracks as well, the ones that might be associated with those terraces sliding down into craters. Now, you've probably heard the old adage that states that Mother Nature is lazy. She always takes the path of least resistance. Well, in this case, the path of least resistance is to keep the crack straight. So in the case of a large-scale, orderly collapse of the crater rim by neat and tidy terraces, which might be tens to even a, maybe even 100 kilometers in length, we see them backed by long, straight scarps that they slid down. That's these things out here. Well, look, this mouse. That's these things here. They're the terraces, long terraces. And where they're well developed all around the crater, the resulting geometry of the outermost crater rim is therefore hexagonal. But in the case of a crater rim collapsed by messy landslides made of lots of short fractures, long straight scarps might have formed as collapse initiated. But there's no requirement for them to do so. So crater rims tend to remain circular in outline in that case. So when I say growing old polygonally, by old I mean immediately after the initial impact ca cavity formed and the crater walls started to collapse, which is really pretty young, if you get my point. So that's my hypothesis. Now, bearing the hypothesis in mind, let's take a look at some other examples of polygonal impact craters on the moon and basins. Next one, please, Chris. I'm sure many of you have seen Theophilus. It's a very nice circular crater. But take a look at its older neighbor, Cyrillus. It may be beaten to a pulp, but it's clearly defined by a hexagonal outer rim. Look at the straight sides here, here, and here. Next one, please. Here are well-known Aristoteles and Eudoxus with their smaller, more subtle neighbor, Egede. Egede is this one down, down here, by the way. Neither Arist Aristoteles nor Eudoxus show signs of neat, orderly collapsed terraces. Both show evidence of messy landslide collapse. But both show well-illuminated western outer rims defined by straight scarps. This is particularly clear in Eudoxus. Look at that. And there's a straight, a straight segment there as well with 120-degree internal angles. They're only partly polygonal, hybrid if you like. Egedy, on the other hand, is flooded and defined by a crater rim that looks kind of like a cross or a mix between a circle and a polygon. And in this case, it looks rather like a distorted square with four sides. Next one, please, Chris. Here's Latron, a tilted, flooded impact crater that you could easily dismiss as circular in outline. But it certainly has one, at least, straight segment to its outer rim. So I would identify this as a hybrid as well. Next one, please. Posidonius, which is this big crater here, is another great favorite among lunar observers. But take a good look at ghostly Shakonak on its southeast side. Here's, get this mouse to come to life. Here's Shakonak. And Posidonius is indeed round, but Shakonak is clearly hexagonal in outline. Look, one, two, three, four, five, and I think that's six across there. While we're here, take a look at Danielle Crater up in the, the, the upper part of the slide. The illumination in this image clearly brings out three straight segments and the two internal angles of 120 degrees on its west side. Next one, please, Chris. OK, hands up all those who've never observed Clavius through a telescope. And for the rest of you who have, now how many of you have spotted the three straight sides? One, two, three, on the western part of the outer rim with the 120 degree internal angles. Next one, please. Which brings us back to Hercules, which we previously saw in the bottom right corner of the image of Lacus Mortis, which is where my whole story started. And its next door neighbor, Atlas. 
Although the southern parts of the crater rims in both cases certainly look at a circular in outline, the northern parts of both are well illuminated and clearly made of straight segments. Look at Atlas here, look at that straight scarp. There's another one there and another one coming down there. And again, one, two, three. With, of course, the 120 degree internal angles. Next one, please, Chris. Okay, even when the view is extremely foreshortened due to location of the crater close to the lunar horizon, or LEM, we can still clearly see the hexagonal outer rims of numerous flooded craters, flooded again by basalt. Basalt, which floods them such that their internal collapse features are hidden from view. This last point is going to be common to the next two images, so keep it in mind. Here we see the crater J. Herschel, that's mouse, that's this one here which preserves a very nice hexagonal shape. Look, straight, 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 straight. And I think that's straight across the top there as well. And also note the very obviously hexagonal Pythagoras crater up in the northeastern corner, or northwestern corner there. Next one, please. Moving to the northeast lunar limb, notice the hexagonal crater Gartner. That's over here. Straight, straight. A little straight down there and straight across there. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that many of the least ambiguous hexagonal impact out crater outlines are most evident when craters have been flooded by, by basalt lava, such that only their external rim margins are visible because, as proposed in my hypothetical model, that's where the long, straight, collapse-related scarps would be located, and they are what define the polygonal crater shapes. And the potentially circular noise represented by the collapsed terraces and landslides inside the crater have been filtered out by these flooded craters. Next one, please. Now, most of the craters I've discussed so far, perhaps with the exception of Egede, have been in the same kind of size range, somewhere in the 100 to a couple of hundred of kilometers uh, diameter. So how does my hypothesis hold for impact features of other sizes? Well, here's Wallace down here in the southeast corner of the Imbrium Impact Basin. It's small, but it is resolvable in a backyard telescope. Just like Egida, it looks to me like a distorted square with four straight sides. They're sort of straight and curved, right? So it's a, it's a cross. So here's my take-home message on this, or here's one of my take-home messages. Small impact craters only need four straight scarps in order to successfully collapse by long fracture propagation. Think of the meteor crater in Arizona, for example. It's square. Whereas larger impact craters require six. Next one, please. So what do we find if we examine really large impact craters? Well, here's the tilted and flooded sinus iridum on the northwest side of the Imbrium Impact Basin. You've already seen this picture. What you didn't see was that it's one, uh, it's one of the most observed features on the moon, but what I see here are one, two, three, four straight segments. How many of you have recorded that in your observing notes? Let's go up in scale. Next one, please, Chris. Here's another favorite, the flooded Crisium Impact Basin. Tell me that's not bounded by six straight segments with internal 120 degree angles, and tell me that that is not a symmetrical hexagon. Next one, please. Moving to the really big impact basin scale, here in the southwest corner of the Mare Serenitatis, we see two admittedly relict straight segments. One, two, and that's down in this area here, with an internal 120 degree angle. Next one, please, Chris. So does that mean that all major impact basins are hexagonal in shape? Certainly not. This is a pretty obvious, this is pretty obvious from this satellite image of the enormous Mare Orientale Basin. That's this thing here. It's a multi-ring basin, which we can only glimpse very rarely and very obliquely from Earth, which shows that its multiple collapse scarps are clearly circular in shape. Why? I think it's so large that the collapsed scarps, if they're present, are so numerous that they merge visually into a pretty continuous circular geometry. So my next one, please, Chris. And this is my last slide. So my take home message tonight is this. When you, when you next look at the impact features on the moon, take the time to see what you're actually looking at. In particular, Make sure that you distinguish the inner collapse terraces and landslide materials from the outer crater rims. Or where the craters or impact basins are flooded with lavas, be aware that you may be only observing the outer crater rim itself. 
Many impact Many impact features have remained circular in outline since their formation, but many, as I said, up to about 20% on the Moon, have not. I find it interesting that many well-known lunar commentators, including Chuck Woods of the Lunar Picture of the Day fame, he's the guy that actually runs the website, do not highlight this aspect of impact crater evolution, even when it's readily apparent in the images that they're describing. So. See how many square and especially hexagonal and especially symmetrical hexagonal impact crater and basin shapes you can identify on the moon's surface through your telescope. As always, thanks for listening. Folks, we're, we're going to just do one question. Uh, is there, um, if you could turn on the lights for one second. Um, okay, I'm going to go with. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's go with this uh, gentleman here. You can speak up real loud. Uh, does angle and velocity of impact bear any challenge or any change to these features? No, because unless you're looking at a really low angle of impact by the impactor that makes the crater, and I mean about 10, 10 degrees, the mechanism for the formation of the initial hull is basically that the material goes up and out symmetrically. Even if the thing comes in at 20 degrees, 25, 30 degrees. So the initial impact cavity is always circular in shape. The velocity would have no impact. But now that's almost a tautology. The, the velocity would not influence its shape, that's for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Simon is available after the meeting for questions as well. All right, quick, some real quick announcements here. Um, and I, I, maybe we can finish before 10.35. Uh, Earth Hour, a big conservation a, a event. Uh, the museum, uh, Science and Technology Museum, does a fine job with Earth Hour. If some of you that have been um, at uh, previous Earth Hour events at the museum, I encourage you to come. It's uh, just over three weeks from now on, on, a, on, a, on a Saturday. Yeah, there's uh, there's um, stargazing, a pretty large group. Um, if you're interested uh, and if you would like to volunteer, please contact uh, Chris Terran there. Next slide, please. Uh, also, uh, over March break, including tomorrow, um, there is uh, solar observing. It's typically right outside the, fr the front door. Obviously, check to see if it's cloudy before, before you come. But nonetheless, the, the museum offers a fine program. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to also say as well, and Bob, if you could stand up. Um, wherever you are, Bob. Okay, terrific. Um, so the... the um, the uh, uh, Pat Brown and, and colleagues run a, um, a astronomy uh, course at the Mill of, Conti uh, of Kintail at, in, in, in Elmont. I've, um, I've seen uh, previous presentations as a very uh, thorough, um, uh, interactive uh, course with uh, lots of observation. Uh, Bob, sorry, one more time, stand up, please. If you're interested in that uh, and want to know more details, it, um, it is free, donations accepted. Please contact Bob uh, right there. Um, really, really nicely done. Next slide, please. Um, if you want to watch this broadcast again, it, you can go to this uh, e e URL. And, uh, and uh, another way of finding it is Google um, RASC, second word Ottawa, third word Ustream. OK, with a uh, U on it. And you'll get to that link. And that will be posted in, um, just minutes after this broadcast. Next slide. Um, our library is uh, open right after this. It's Again, it's just right outside the doors. Take a sharp right. Uh, we have a book of the month, Stargazing for Dummies, um, Estelle's pick, Estelle who uh, runs the library for us. Next slide. Um, after the meeting, we uh, a group of us, um, you're all welcome, uh, meet at the Kelsey's just right at the, uh, uh, right, right at the uh, t top uh, there for some uh, continued discussion. Next slide. Um, tonight we had um, in the audience 185 plus uh, 60. 65 online. 65. 65 online, and oh, I want to say hello to my friend Scott uh, Kilgore, who's is, uh, in uh, Oklahoma City, uh, watching this. Uh, hi, Scott. And um, thank you, everyone, for contributing to this. Um, excellent work. Next slide. Uh, our next meeting is uh, a month from now, the first Friday. It's uh, April the 4th. Um, next slide. And the agenda is uh, three, three, three presenters. You may remember uh, John Wayne Ross. Uh, he's, he's back. He was our presenter of the year last year. You remember all the enthusiasm that he brought to his presentation? Well, he's back again with an ancient view of comets. 
Uh, Bob Hillier is going to be uh, sharing his uh, uh, tr uh, um, trials and tribulations, Bob, of uh, remote observing. Okay, he's got an observatory um, 7,500 kilometers from here, and he can observe from his home. And then Ken Whitnell, who I talked about previously, uh, he's, he has quite a, a, a solar telescope. He's going to give an introduction to solar observing. So if you want to, if you want to get started on this, um, he'll tell you. He'll, he'll give you that. And next slide. Okay. Um, I'm going to close the meeting now. We're going to have, uh, I'm going to call out some door prize numbers here. Peter, if you can come up and help me with this. One thing I wanted to mention just, to, just before we shut, shut down here is uh, please don't run off. I mean, I would love to ch just chat with you outside, uh, outside the meeting. Also, I've been informed that the observatory is open as well. Yeah. I, I think there's some uh, holes in the clouds, so maybe the moon will peek through, maybe Jupiter will peek through. Uh, but either way, it's worth, um, if you have, even if you can't see the sky, it's worth, it's worth seeing the inside of the observatory. But, but don't run out and, and leave us behind here. Just, just stick around. We'd love to chat. Okay. Thank you. The meeting's closed, and uh, we'll call out the door prizes here.